Good morning, everyone. Happy Monday. It is Rachel, Education Specialist at the Topeka Zoo and Conservation Center, and we are back today with our second morning education program. Now, if you weren't here on Friday, how these are going to work is we are going to do a differing grade level curriculum standard every day. And today, we are going to talk about first grade curriculum relating to how plants and animals use their external parts to grow, survive, and meet their needs. So what that looks like in the zoo world is a word that we like to call adaptation. Now what an adaptation is, is it something about the way a plant or animal looks or acts that allows them to stay safe. So what we're going to do today is we are going to look at a variety of adaptations and we have a live animal to meet because adaptations are very important to the survival of every single plant and animal in the world. So let's get started by looking at a few plant adaptations because even plants have different parts of their body that allow them to survive. From the roots to the stems, the flowers to the fruits, plants have many different things that allow them to stay safe if an animal is near and wants to eat them. Our first plant example that we have here is a branch off an acacia tree. These live over in Africa where there's lots of big herbivores that might want to eat them. Now remember, an adaptation is something about the way it looks that keeps it safe. If you look at this tree branch, you might notice that it's got these big, tall, pointy spikes. This is an adaptation. If you were a big herbivore over in Africa eating plants, would you want to eat something so spiky? Definitely not. That would hurt your mouth and your lips and your tongue. So having these spikes all over this branch allows this tree to stay safe and to grow and to meet all of its needs. Let's look at another plant adaptation. What I have here, this is the seed pod of a bur oak. And if you guys notice, the seed is here and it's encased in this hard outer shell. This shell is the adaptation that protects the seed inside. By being encased in this strong outer shell, it would take animals quite a long time to break through this shell to get to the seed inside. So by having this hard outer shell, this is an adaptation, a part of the seed that allows it to stay safe. Plants have lots of adaptations, whether they live on land, in the water, no matter what ecosystem in the world they are found, and so do animals. There are lots of differing adaptations that every animal species and every animal group in the world has. So let's go through some of the unique and fun adaptations that we find in the animal kingdom. One of the first and easy adaptations that we notice when talking about animals is camouflage. Now camouflage is the ability for an animal to blend into its environment. So what I have here, this is the pelt of a coyote and we have these here in Kansas in our prairies and our woodlands. You guys will notice that the coloring of the coyote resembles the earth. It's kind of brown and tan and gold. It's this beautiful earthy color. And that is because this coyote, its parts are meant to allow it to blend in to the grass and the trees and the dirt where it lives. This helps it because any predators who might want to get the coyote, particularly when they're younger, can't see the coyote. And any prey who the coyote wants to eat also cannot see them. So camouflage is an excellent adaptation that we see all across the animal kingdom. Now coloring on an animal is not always so that they want to blend in or camouflage. Sometimes they want to be seen and they want to send a message. I probably don't have to tell you what animal this pelt belongs to, but it is a striped skunk. Now skunks are another local animal we have in Kansas with black fur with white stripes down their body. Unlike our coyote who wants to camouflage into his backgrounds, skunks do not. They want you to see them because what behavioral adaptation do skunks do that allow them to stay safe? You guys probably know they spray. So by having these beautiful black and white colors, this is what we call a warning color in the animal kingdom. And they are warning predators, stay away from me. If you mess with me, I will spray you. 
So by having these colors, this is a message they are sending saying stay away or there will be consequences through my spray. So colors mean differing things in the animal kingdom. Now it's not just the coloring of their body, sometimes it's the shape of it as well. What I have here, this is an adaptation of a spiky animal. It is a porcupine quill. Porcupines and other spiky animals like hedgehogs, tenrecs, echidnas, they use these sharp spines as a way to defend themselves against predators. So adaptations don't always allow an animal to protect themselves, but they also allow them to move from place to place, to find shelter and food and water, to hear, to see, all sorts of differing things. Now for porcupines specifically, this quill allows them to defend themselves if a predator tries to attack. Now sometimes people say that porcupines shoot their quills, but this is not true. There is no magic eject button that they push and the quill goes ching. What a porcupine does instead is they simply back into their predator and stick the quill into the predator's face or another part of their body and it stays there. But by having these long, sharp, uh, hair-like parts of their body, it allows them to stay safe because just like the branch of our acacia tree, predators don't want to bite into something that's spiky. Similarly, other animals like the red duker here use spiky pointier adaptations as a defense as well. Now this animal may look like a deer, but it is actually a type of antelope that lives over in Africa. And they've got these horns on their body that are very, very sharp. So if a predator were trying to attack this duker, they use these horns as a way to defend themselves. Both the males and the females have them. Horns and antlers are very similar in this regard. They're used as a defense. So those external parts allow them to protect themselves if anything tries to harm them. Now, every animal group in the world, not just our mammals, have differing adaptations. What I have here, this is the skull of an American bullfrog. And you guys can see, or the skeleton, I'm sorry, the skull is on top and the skeleton is here. And you guys can see that it's got these long legs. What adaptation do you think uh, having these long legs, how does that help a frog? You guys might have guessed it. It allows them to hop and to swim away from their predators. So if they're on the ground, they can hop three to five feet in one go. And if they're in the water, they can kick those long legs quickly and swim away from predators. Moving on to our reptiles, animals like turtles and tortoises have the adaptation of their shell. So this is the shell of a water turtle, and it is made out of two things. It is made out of bone, like what is inside our body, as well as keratin, which is the same protein your hair and your nails are made out of. This is very strong. So when a predator is attacking a turtle, they can tuck into their shell or swim away, and they are able to stay safe because of this body part. Moving along to our fish, you guys can see I have some shark jaws. What do you think the adaptation of the shark is? Pretty easy to see, right? Those really sharp rows of teeth. So having sharp pointy teeth, especially in food and water that they need. Looking over to our invertebrates, our animals without a backbone, what I have here is a scorpion, okay? Now scorpions, they have two main ways to protect themselves. The first are these pinchers at the front of their body that they can use to distract a predator who wants to eat them. And the other is this long tail equipped with a stinger and venom at the end of their body. So these two body parts allow a scorpion to stay safe and to find the food that they need to survive. Moving on to our birds. This is one of my favorite adaptations in the animal kingdom. This is the wing of a barred owl, which is one of our types of owls that we have in Kansas. Now the beautiful coloring on it, you might notice, just like our coyote, is an excellent example of camouflage. They blend in perfectly with our trees here in Kansas. But one of my other favorite things about the shape of owl wings is that they are actually designed to be silent. So when this owl moves its wing in the wild, you can't hear anything. 
So talk about an amazing adaptation. Their prey animals like mice don't even know the owl is there until it is too late and they are in the talons. Now you guys, coloring in the animal kingdom can mean all sorts of different things. We've talked about camouflage, we've talked about warning colors in a skunk. Well, these two feathers that I have are bright red and blue. They belong to a bird we have in our rainforest here. Does anybody know what kind of bird has bright red and blue feathers? It is a type of parrot. These belong to the scarlet macaws. Now being bright red in the rainforest where they live, this is not to camouflage, it's not to warn their predators away, it's actually how they get a boyfriend and a girlfriend. And the scarlet macaw world being bright colors is what allows them to find a partner. And so colors in the animal kingdom oftentimes mean differing things. Here I've got a, a toy type of frog. This is also a type of frog that lives in tropical regions, but it is bright red. It is not trying to attract a partner like the macaws. It has another message to send. This adaptation is because it is poisonous. This is a poison dart frog, and this bright color is telling predators, do not eat me or there will be consequences. You're gonna get really sick and maybe even pass away if you eat a poison dart frog. So friends, adaptations in the animal kingdom are very interesting from coloring to sound, defense to how they find their food. Their external parts, the way they look, allows them to survive and meet their needs. So just like on Friday, I've got four animals here that I want you guys to guess what their adaptations are. It's a little bit of a quiz and then we're gonna meet our live animal. So here I have a picture of the armadillo species we have at the Topeka Zoo, the three-banded armadillo. What is the main adaptation of this armadillo? What body parts help it to survive? If you said the shell, you are right. Just like a turtle, the shell is made out of bone and fingernails, and the armadillo takes it a step further. They curl up into a ball to protect themselves against their predators. So having that hard outer shell is an excellent adaptation to survive. Now the next one, this is a frog, but it's before it even turns into an adult. These are the eggs of bullfrogs, and one bullfrog mom can lay up to 20,000 eggs at a time in a pond here in Kansas. Now, what do you notice about these eggs that you think would allow them to survive? Even before they hatch out into a tadpole, you guys can see that there are a lot of them, they are really small, and that they camouflage. All three of these things are adaptations because by laying thousands of eggs, it ensures that hopefully at least some of them make it so that they can hatch and become tadpoles. By being so small and clear, blending in with the water, most predators like fish don't get to see them. Now here's another one of my favorite animals that people oftentimes don't love. These are a picture of a tarantulas. So we have a big mama tarantula here with lots of little babies. Now spiders, as a type of arachnid, a type of bug, they do have differing adaptations. Does anybody have a guess as to why tarantulas have these little hairs all over their body? It is not to stay warm. If any of you guessed that, that's a good guess, but these animals are cold-blooded, so they have to get their heat from the sun or the earth around them. The reason they have those hairs is it's an adaptation to pick up on vibrations, on sounds around them. They can tell by the footsteps of a predator if they are near, they can feel it in those hairs. And if there's a smaller animal like a prey that they can eat, they still pick it up in those hairs. So by having hairs all over their body, it's not to look scary, it's not to stay warm, it actually allows them to know what types of animals are near and how they should respond. All right, here's our final one, and this one's a little bit of a harder one. So I actually have two types of snakes here on this picture. I've got the milk snake on top, 
and I've got the coral snake on bottom. Just like our poison dart frog, these two animals are using color as a warning color. But what's interesting about these adaptations is that only one of these snakes can actually hurt you if they bite you. The coral snake is venomous, the milk snake is not. But what the milk snake is doing is they are mimicking the colors of the venomous coral snake. We actually have milk snakes in Kansas, they can't hurt you. We don't have coral snakes, but in some parts of their range they overlap. So by looking like a snake that can hurt you, the milk snake is staying safe, even though she is not venomous herself. So what I wanna do next is I want to meet a live animal. Now this animal, I have to clear some space for on my table because she loves to roam all across the table. Now, so far, we have been talking all about adaptations in terms of the way plants and animals look. But it's not just the way that a plant or animal looks that keeps them safe. It's also how they act. So this animal that we're going to get out is one of my absolute favorites because she has some really interesting adaptations in terms of how she acts. So give me just one second. I'm going to get out Jill. And she is one of our favorite education animals. I've got her in her little carrier down here and I'm going to bring her out. All righty. So you guys might have guessed that this is a Virginia opossum. Now you guys might have noticed that I called her an opossum and not a possum. Did you know that opossums and possums are different types of animals? Possums are a type of animal that lives over in Australia and parts of Asia. Whereas opossums, like the one you see in front of you, live in the Americas. Now this here is the Virginia opossum and it is the only type of opossum that we have in the United States. Now, a lot of people don't like opossums. They think they kind of resemble rodents, like mice and rats because they have a long nose and a long hairless tail, people sometimes think they are mice and rats. Interestingly, they are not. They are actually a marsupial. Does anybody know what a marsupial is? I'll give you an example. A kangaroo is a marsupial, okay? Marsupials are types of mammals that carry their babies in a pouch. So Jill here, as an opossum, she actually has a pouch on her stomach, and if she were to have babies, that is where she carries them. She is not related to mice and rats. She is related to kangaroos and other types of marsupials. Now, I am feeding her her diet. Jill here is what we call a scavenger animal, which means she will eat anything she comes across. She will eat a variety of fruits and vegetables. She will also eat other animals. Her favorite food are grapes, which she is enjoying right now. Other things in her diet today are some biscuits, some apples, some carrots, and some mice. So she is an omnivore. She eats both plants as well as meat. Now, if you look at Jill, you'll notice that she has some pretty good adaptations in terms of the way she looks. She does have this beautiful earthy colored fur that allows her to camouflage. Her hairless tail aids her in climbing trees, so she can uh, hold on to trees, although they don't sleep hanging by their tail. That is a myth. Um, and she has a long nose and big ears. Opossums actually can't see very well, so they have to rely on their sense of smell and their sense of hearing to find food. Now, Opossums, it's not the way they look that mostly keeps them safe, although their camouflage does help. It's how they act. People sometimes don't like opossums because opossums can get into their garages and their sheds underneath their houses, but opossums are just looking for a nice place to live, just like we are. If you have an opossum underneath your house or in your backyard, there is no reason to worry because opossums are really good to have around. Their behaviors might tell you otherwise, so let's talk about that. 
Because opossums can't see very well, but they can smell and hear well, they know when a predator is near, but they can't always see where a predator is. So their first line of defense, once they know a predator is trying to attack them, is to bar their teeth and to hiss. Now hissing generally makes it sound like an animal is aggressive. The reason opossum hisses is because they have 50 teeth inside their mouth, 50. It's the most of any land mammal on our continent. Come here, Jill. So she bars all of those teeth and she hisses and she says, hey, stay away from me. I don't wanna hurt you, but I will if I have to. Now people think that an opossum can bite you when they do this, but remember, opossums have really bad eyesight. So they're not going to bite you because they can't really even see where, they, where you are. They are hissing to act bigger and meaner and scarier than they actually are. Now, the second thing that an opossum is known for doing is people say an opossum plays possum or they play dead. This is actually a myth. Opossums do not play dead. When you were younger, or maybe even still now, you might have been in your bedroom and somebody comes in and you act like you're asleep and you close your eyes and you're really awake and you play like you're asleep. Opossums don't do that. When they smell a predator, they don't just close their eyes and act like they're dead. They are so scared, their body can't control it. They actually faint, which means they pass out. They are not awake. And when they do this fainting, they let out a smell that makes them smell dead. And so predators think something's wrong with them. They see that opossum that was just alive and all of a sudden uh, it died. And the predator thinks maybe they're sick, maybe they're poisoned. And the predator says, I don't wanna eat that dead sickly opossum. I want something hot and fresh and juicy. And so they leave them alone. It can take up to four hours for an opossum to wake up after fainting. So if you have one in your yard and it looks like it's dead, maybe it just fainted. So please don't ever try and move an opossum. Give it some time to wake up. Now let's talk about why we should love these animals because they are here to help us as humans. The first reason is they are Earth's cleanup crew. They love eating dead animals. So if an animal has been hit by a car or have died naturally, opossums are the garbage men and women of the animal kingdom. They will come along and eat up those dead things, making our world cleaner. They're also immune to the venom of snakes. So if you have copperheads or rattlesnakes around and you have an opossum, they are going to eat those venomous snakes. And even if they get bit, it's not going to affect them. These guys are also important because they eat ticks, which carry Lyme disease that can be transferred onto humans. Opossums are so good at eating ticks that scientists estimate they can eat up to 5,000 ticks in a single season. Now, sometimes people think because opossums hiss, they have a disease called rabies. And this is a disease that animals get that does eventually kill them and they can get very aggressive. And if you ever see an animal in the wild hissing, do not approach it. But friends, opossums, it's incredibly rare for them to get rabies because they have a lower body temperature than other mammals. They run in the low 90s. And because of that, the rabies virus cannot live inside them. So if you have an opossum in your yard, as opposed to being scared of it and running away and screaming, give it a name. Welcome it to the family. And thank it for working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, free of charge. Don't feed it. Don't mess with it, but if it's out there, it's eating the snakes, the ticks, the dead things. It is keeping humans healthy and safe. Now, one final thing with opossums. Because they are marsupials, they carry their babies in their pouch. If you ever happen to hit an opossum when you're driving, which is unfortunate, that does happen to them quite often, please get out and make sure it's not a mom with babies in her pouch. Although the mom has perished, we can oftentimes still save the babies. We have the Northeast Kansas Wildlife Rescue Unit. They will come out and get the babies. And the number for that is a really easy one to remember if you ever have to call. It's 785-575-1991. So if you ever have an opossum or any animal that you think is injured, they will come and rescue it. So you guys, the final thing 
I want to say today is this. All animals in the animal kingdom and all plants have adaptations that allow them to survive. From spikes to camouflage, feigning to color, all of these things help them to find the food and water and shelter that they need. But it's also up to us humans to protect them. So if you see an animal and you're scared of it, please don't react by harming it. That animal is around, it's here to help, just like the opossum. And remember, the zoo is always a resource. You can always call us and ask those questions. We would be happy to help. Now, for those of you first graders at home still learning about how animals use their parts, we are going to be adding in the comments and a little bit later, two worksheets. One has a list of a whole bunch more plants and animals and the adaptations that they have. And another is a worksheet asking you guys to draw some animals who are designed for differing things. Like the first one says, draw an animal that could quickly dig a tunnel or burrow to get away from its predators. Now, even if you don't have a printer, you can still do these. Just copy down your answers on another piece of paper and add them into the comments later today. So you guys, I wanna thank you so much for listening to our first grade program. On Wednesday this week at 10 o'clock, we will be talking about second grade standards. So make sure to join us then. And if you have any questions, we will take them now. Um, we had a couple earlier. Um, how do, what kind of adaptations do giraffes have to eat the acacia tree? Um, they actually have really thick tongues that allow them to pull off the acacia even through the spikes. And their tongues are purple, which acts as a sunscreen to block any uh, radiation from the sun from burning them. Good question. Do you know if that what fainting goats do? Is that what happens to fainting goats? I'm not they sure. We'll have to look into that and answer later. Um, that's a really good question if they have the same kind of adaptation as an opossum. I've never actually met a fainting goat, but now I kind of want to. <laughs> you, you've met one? Yeah. It's not the same. Oh. Right, okay, so Keeper Kristen is back here, and she just, no, thank you, she just answered the question for us. So she said with fainting goats, it's kind of like humans, it's a response they have, it's not the same as an opossum, um, they can't control it, but it is a condition that they have. So, thank you for that. Yeah, no worries, it's apparently got a weird name. <laughs> so as we're looking at questions, I wanna show you guys one of Jill's tricks if she'll do it. Um, it's not it's not something we trained her to do, but oftentimes um, she does do it. Let's see if I can collect some of her food here. Jill, do you want to do it for us today? Come here. No, nope, she's more interested in the food on the table. So every once in a while, she actually likes to show how well they can climb by climbing into her carrier here. Now, like I said, we did not actually train her to do this. This is something she just did on her own. So did our other opossum, actually. So she can smell that this is her carrier. It's gonna go back to her large enclosure that she has over in our, um, on the other side of the zoo. And so she actually, can you get up there? <laughs> she actually just climbs right in. Uh, she just naturally did it. We've never once trained her to do that. You got it? She's got a little bit of her winter weight on, so there she goes. So Jill is showing you how well that they can climb. Alrighty, did we have any other questions? Yeah. Is their eyesight both bad in the daylight and the nighttime? Um, it's not great during either part of the day, no. So they are mostly going to rely on their sense of smell and their sense of hearing. So if you guys were watching when I was giving her those pieces of food, she wasn't even paying attention to my hand. It was the smell of the food that she was paying attention to. So they have to rely on their sense of smell and their sense of hearing. Now they are a nocturnal species, which means they're out at nighttime, but sometimes in the winter, they switch to coming out during the day because it's really cold at night and they can get frostbite on their tail and their ears and their fingers. Eli says that most marsupials live in South America or Australia, except for opossums. That's right, thank you, Eli. He's one of my favorite zoo camp kids. He has been here since um, he was born, essentially, and he is gonna take my job someday. So, Eli, one of these days, you should just come in here and film one of these for me and I can have a break. Um, okay. Well, it seems like that is most of the questions for today. If you have any more, you can add them to the uh, comments and we will try and get to them a little bit later. 
Um, but for now, we hope to see you guys on Wednesday for our 10 o'clock session on second grade. Oh, one, one more two question. more questions. Awesome, I'll take it. Uh, can opossums hang by their tails? They can. So their tail has muscles around it. So especially when they're younger, they can hang by their tail. A, a full-grown opossum like Jill here probably isn't going to do that because um, she's too heavy now. And they don't sleep by their tails. Kind of like humans, we can hang by our arms from a tree, but if we tried to sleep like that, we'd fall off. It's the same thing with the opossums. Can you explain the rabies thing again? Right, so opossums, they have a lower body temperature than other mammals. So we as humans, our normal body temperature is 97, 98 degrees. Opossums, they are in the lower 90s, 91, 92, 93 degrees Fahrenheit. And because of that, it's too cold in their body for the rabies virus to survive. So they are hissing at you because they're scared, they can't see, they don't know what's going on, they have 50 teeth, so they're barring those teeth, acting like they're big and scary, but they're not gonna bite you because they can't really see you, and they don't carry rabies. So if you have an opossum in your yard, leave it alone. Let it do its magic eating the dead things, but don't worry about rabies, okay? These animals are not ones that are disease carrying like other types of mammals. Okay. Well, thank you guys so much. Have a wonderful rest of the day, and we'll see you on Wednesday.